I will say before I start that I've been very proud to say to you all during the entirety of the pandemic, which is more than two years, that I have never uh, done other than to accept the advice of Dr. Davila. But this morning I adopted a different approach in that when I rappelled down a, a, a 19 story building, I did not ask for her advice before I did that because I'm sure she would have said, in the interest of uh, various things, it was probably not uh, something she would advise. But having said that, it was very interesting. Um, today, is a very important uh, milestone in our ongoing fight against COVID-19. And so, uh, along with announcing the official end of the emergency declaration, we wanted to provide an update, Dr. Davila and myself, uh, on Team Toronto's ongoing vaccination effort and the current state of the pandemic uh, in our city. Our work to help people across the city get vaccinated and protect themselves against COVID-19 continues. Just last week uh, at our Metro Hall vaccination clinic, we announced that we've administered 7 million vaccine doses across the city throughout the time of the various vaccination campaigns. This is a remarkable thing for a city of 3 million people. And it's also a great testament to Team Toronto's work uh, in, in terms of all that they have done. And Team Toronto, as you know, consists of all kinds of healthcare workers, community organizations, doctors, nurses, uh, public servants and others. Uh, and it is also a great testament to Torontonians who have stepped up to protect themselves, uh, their loved ones and their community. And I think people have taken the latter part very seriously, that they are doing something not just to protect themselves, but to protect the collective health of the people of the City of Toronto. And I think it is fair to say that now we are reaping the benefits of those decisions, those very personal decisions made by people, but also the decisions made by us in the management of the pandemic uh, in terms of how we rolled out uh, the vaccine so successfully. Uh, and we are the people who have put numbers on the board that are world leading in terms of what they uh, represent for a big city. And it's helped us to move forward with our reopening and our recovery. And it really has been all the way through an all hands on deck approach. And so I just want to say thank you. And I can't thank often enough. And you've heard me say it before. But I will thank the staff and the partners and the volunteers and the, and the ambassadors. But most of all, the people who have been the ones that have stepped up to receive those 7 million vaccination doses. Uh, we continue uh, as a city government uh, to lead in the process of delivering a hyper local equity focused vaccination model. And hyperlocal is exactly what it sounds like, building by building, street by street, school by school, subway station by subway station. And the equity focused part also continues to be a major priority of ours in that we are focused on areas where people may find it a bit more difficult or be a bit more hesitant uh, and where socioeconomic circumstances uh, dictate that we should be making an extra special effort for areas that are underrepresented in terms of vaccination. And we've seen great success with this approach. So that meant that 46 shop and vax clinics in April in shopping centres and malls, 45 clinics in Toronto Public Libraries in the month of March, and dozens of clinics leading to 4,000 vaccinations carried out in TCT stations were all significant contributors to that ongoing effort, which just has to go on day after day, week after week, and we're not, uh, we're not curtailing those efforts at all. Uh, we've also uh, initiated, as major events returned, pop-up clinics happening at things like the St. Patrick's Day Parade and the Easter Parade. In the month of April alone, more than 10,000 doses were administered across 514 mobile clinics. And I know that that is not a number per clinic per day that was uh, met earlier on, but we just have to keep at it because the people uh, now that are not vaccinated are a minority, but nonetheless, they're a minority relative to the population as a whole, but they're a very important group uh, for us to reach uh, because they too deserve and need all of the benefits that have, uh, have, have uh, accrued to all of the other people of Toronto that have received the 7 million doses. This strategy that we've adopted, it works. That is why our numbers are, are, are in a leadership position of major cities like us across the globe. If we make it as easy as possible for people to get the vaccine at the places we know are part of their, their everyday lives, like malls and TTC stations and very local places, uh, we will continue to vaccinate those who've yet to have all of their doses. And of course, our objective is to make sure people can have all of one, two, three or fourth dose uh, because there are people that haven't had uh, any of those. Uh, we have many more clinics on tap in the week, weeks ahead, including at local faith-based uh, centres in the community and events such as the East York Farmers Market, the Newcomer Day and Doors Open, the Newcomer Day of course being right here at Nathan Phillips Square. Many more of these clinics are yet to be announced. Uh, they are just some of the examples of the unique opportunities that we are seeking in order to make sure that we go where people are, uh, especially people who have not yet been vaccinated. 
And this all is on top of the five city-run immunization clinics we continue to operate, now at Metro Hall. It used to be at the Convention Centre. We're now at Metro Hall, the Cloverdale Mall, 1940 Eglinton Avenue New East, which is roughly at Warden and Eglinton, Mitchell Field Community Centre and the Woodbine Mall. And again, people should know those are still open. They can check at toronto.ca for the details about those clinics and all of the other ones at toronto.ca. The work of our valued vaccine engagement teams and community ambassadors is also continuing. We would not have reached the milestones we are marking without them. They have brought their credibility, they have brought their local knowledge, they have brought the trust people have in them, whether it's the local pastor or a local uh, representative of the uh, community health organization and a host of others. And they've brought that uh, credibility and legitimacy to bear on reducing hesitations about vaccination and increasing uptake in under-vaccinated communities. It's an impressive team. It's comprised of more than 200 different community health organizations and faith-based organizations with 600 well-known and well-trusted, locally well-known and locally well-trusted ambassadors who've been working on the ground in the neighborhoods, reaching out to those who are hardest hit. A major part of their work includes making personal connections within their communities. I've seen it work. They literally will go to the door and knock on the door, aware of the fact, because we have the lists, that people have not been vaccinated, and discuss with them their concerns, discuss the benefits, discuss the reasons why they should get vaccinated. And similarly, I have seen instances where that knock on the door has led to someone coming downstairs in that building or otherwise very nearby and getting vaccinated. Between March 2021 and March 2022, community ambassadors spent approximately 70,000 hours building vaccine confidence by engaging Torontonians more than 2 million times in 43 different languages. This is the way we have to do it in Toronto. This is the way we've done it in Toronto. And that is why in our city, relative to any other city like it, we have posted numbers that are leading across the globe. That is why I support Dr. Davila's recommendation, uh, which is in front of the Board of Health, that this program will be continued with funding support from the Provincial Ministry of Health, the ambassador program and the community program that is meant to get two people where they are and where they live and, and where they uh, work and play. And that is because, simply put, COVID-19 is still here. Notwithstanding this update, which is meant to be positive, because it is, and notwithstanding what I'm going to get to in a moment, which is the... the um, repealing of the state of emergency in the city after all this time, uh, COVID-19 is still here. I have two friends that contracted it this weekend, and they were people who were vaccinated. Now, fortunately, I think they're going to end up in a situation where they will spend the time at home and not in the hospital, and that's the idea here. Uh, but the bottom line is it's still here, and the public health officials led by Dr. Davila make it very clear that the vaccines do make a difference. They help protect people from COVID-19, and the data is clear you are much more likely to end up in the hospital because of COVID-19 if you are not vaccinated or if you don't have as many doses as you are eligible to receive. So while our work to confront COVID-19 continues, it is clear that we have made progress. And after extensive consultation with city officials, I have determined we no longer need to maintain in place the emergency declaration I signed in March of 2020, the first ever declared in the history of our city. So this morning, I signed a document at 7.30 this morning, officially terminating the emergency declaration in Toronto. The city had been operating under this emergency declaration for 777 days. It came into effect on March 23, 2020. The declaration signaled our intent to fight COVID-19 with everything we had. And now, two years, one month and 17 days later, and more than 7 million doses of vaccine later, there is no doubt that our collective efforts have been successful in getting us to a better place. And I say a better place because we have to remind ourselves all the time the terrible toll this took on people with lives lost, loved ones lost, people who got very ill and have, haven't been able to enjoy a full recovery. I should point out if you want to ask, well, why did we declare a state of emergency? The principal benefit of it was that it gave us flexibility with respect to uh, the public servants and being able to put them where they were needed the most. And so during the course of the pandemic, we redeployed some 1,700 people uh, and we had, had flexibility under the emergency declaration to do that. And I should tell you that notwithstanding that the emergency declaration gave us the flexibility to do that, we had immense cooperation, for which I'm extremely grateful, from the unions representing our workers uh, and from the workers themselves who agreed to be redeployed where we needed them, in the shelters, uh, in different places where we had great need of people to help us out in an emergency situation. Uh, I will tell you that all but 40 of those people who were redeployed at one time during the pandemic have now been returned to their own original jobs. Uh, and that was something that uh, was also a good development that we were in a position where we were able to do that. 
I should also tell you that over the course of the emergency apparatus that was put in place, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, you know o overseen by myself and Dr. Davila and uh, Chief Pegg and City Manager Chris Murray, we had 354 meetings of that group uh, that managed the pandemic and uh, and produced some of the results that we've been discussing today. So to reassure those who will be thinking about this as a last thought for today, um, I want people to understand that by taking away the state of emergency in the city, we are not ending our fight against COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 is still active in the city. The work that we have been undertaking will not stop. I think I've made that very clear today. Our vaccination efforts, our public health guidance from Dr. Davila and her team, and recovery supports will continue to be available from the city working with the other governments. Under provincial order, the masking in critical areas, including public transit, remains mandatory until at least June the 11th. But terminating the emergency is a sign of the progress we have made by following public health guidance, sacrificing throughout the past two years and getting vaccinated. And I want to pay particular tribute at this juncture, again, knowing it's not the end, but it is an important juncture in the pandemic, to thank Dr. Davila in particular. Um, she has been a source, as I've said many, many times, of very wise, steady advice, and she's a very wise and steady person. Um, and that is why it's been possible for me, with a lot of questions asked, as I've often said, to accept her advice without qualification uh, when it was rendered. But I also want to say thank you to Chief Pegg, who uh, did a tremendous job organizing a lot of the logistics of how we delivered those 7 million doses, and to our city manager, Chris Murray, who helped to do a lot of the deployments, for example, that we needed to do to get people where they were needed the most. Each of these people and all the people who work with them, because they'd be the first to say that they are leaders of great teams of people, uh, have each of these people, though, have provided the leadership to their teams in acting decisively and in a steady, calm, competent manner to address uh, the pandemic to date. And to that end, I would like to sort of express my personal thanks to all of the City of Toronto staff, and that's a very wide-ranging group. Uh, First responders are not city staff, but they are people that are in the city orbit, our police officers, firefighters, paramedics, public health people, and all the people who work directly for the city, transit uh, workers and others who are working for our agencies and boards and commissions. Never before has a municipal workforce been called upon to do the things that they had to do to mobilize so quickly to do those things and to put on the record such a remarkable performance in the interest of our collective health and well-being. City staff worked with our community partners to protect our most vulnerable through emergency measures in the areas of child care, shelter, elder care, food banks, business support, and the list goes on. When the vaccines became available, they were on the front lines uh, with Team Toronto Partners bringing clinics to every single corner of this city. The doctors, the nurses, the hospital workers, the clinic staff, the community agencies, they are not directly city workers at all, but they are people who are an incredibly important part of Team Toronto and rightfully called heroes because they've been key uh, to our fight against COVID-19. And I want to thank all of them for their efforts, and I want to say that their efforts do not go unnoticed by the city uh, or by the mayor. And while repeating that the pandemic is not over, I do want to thank Torontonians for getting us this far with these numbers that are, that are numbers that any city in the world would be proud to post and most haven't been as able to do so as we've been. And this allowed us to face down what is un unquestionably the single biggest challenge that will be faced by our generation, at least up to date. We have a lot of work to do to make sure that the comeback is as complete as possible and as inclusive as possible. But based on the gains that we've made during the pandemic, I'm absolutely confident that brighter days are ahead for the city and that a strong comeback is possible and probable, highly probable for the city because all the raw materials are there that were there before the pandemic led by a lot of smart people who want to do well, who want to lead the world in terms of a sustainable, strong, uh, inclusive economic success. And that will be my focus in the weeks and months ahead, protecting our progress, making sure we don't slide backwards in any way, and building on that progress to achieve a strong recovery and more beyond the recovery period. So on that note, with my profound thanks again to her and to all the other people who have made it possible for us to get to this day, which is only one more way station along the way, I would ask Dr. DeVilla to come and deliver her remarks for today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning. It is incredible to realize, as the Mayor just said, that Toronto has been under an emergency order for 777 days. Like the mayor, I will never forget the hard work, the resilience, the perseverance and dedication 
of the staff, volunteers, ambassadors, and dozens and dozens of partners who have helped to respond and those that continue to respond to this once in a lifetime public health crisis. I am eternally grateful for and truly in awe of the resilience of Toronto residents. Today is the beginning of National Nursing Week. So with this in mind, I do want to acknowledge the crucial role of nurses in all of our communities and on the front lines of this pandemic. Thank you to the more than 1,300 public health nurses and registered practical nurses at Toronto Public Health who show up every day to protect and promote the health of Toronto residents. As people giving care, as advocates, advisors, immunizers, care ma case managers, and in the many, many roles that they play. Thank you to all of you. Today, I'm also happy to share some encouraging news with Toronto in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm happy to report that this week, Toronto's COVID-19 indicators are either decreasing or holding stable. While Toronto Public Health continues to keep a close eye on both institutional outbreaks and the severe outcomes of COVID-19 infections across the city, I'm encouraged to see signs of improvement in the indicators related to Toronto's health system capacity and in our weekly case rates, percent positivity and wastewater signals. These are positive signs that coupled with this warmer weather, give us hope that COVID-19 activity in the city will continue to decrease. And so I encourage Toronto residents to take advantage of these warmer temperatures and enjoy the sunshine, open windows, and take your social gatherings outdoors as much as possible. That being said, as the mayor just said as well, this isn't a signal that we can let down our guard when it comes to COVID-19, nor is it time to let go on efforts to get Torontonians their next dose of vaccine. In fact, now is the time for every resident to ensure that they are up to date with their COVID-19 vaccinations. There is emerging evidence of increases in COVID-19 reinfection from peer jurisdictions like the United States, the United Kingdom and South Africa that are currently experiencing an increase in Omicron subvariants and sublineages in recent weeks. The evidence suggests that natural protection provided from a previous COVID-19 infection may be evaded by Omicron. Toronto Public Health is still collecting and analyzing our local data on this issue but it appears that there has been an increase in the proportion of cases that are reinfections in 2022. So, if you have experienced a COVID-19 infection during the Omicron wave, and many have, you should not rely on protection from that previous infection alone against contracting COVID-19 in the future. And the risk of reinfection to people who are unvaccinated has likely increased because of the Omicron subvariants. The good news is that vaccination has been shown to enhance protection against COVID-19 even after an infection. This is especially true when you are up to date with your booster doses. And for our part, Toronto Public Health will continue to pull out all the stops when it comes to getting Toronto residents their next dose of COVID-19 vaccine. As the Mayor indicated over the last month, Toronto Public Health and our partners have continued to bring COVID-19 vaccines to where Toronto lives, works, studies and plays. We held 514 mobile vaccination clinic over opportunities over the month of April, which delivered more than 10,100 doses of COVID-19 vaccine. Nearly 3,400 doses were delivered through the Vax and Ride campaign at TTC stations. And this 
is in addition to the more than 22,000 doses delivered at the city's five fixed site immunization clinics. As you heard the mayor say, in May, we're bringing mobile clinics to farmers markets, to doors open Toronto, and to buildings that are accessible to Toronto's senior residents. Our vaccine engagement teams and vaccine ambassadors are essential components to the success of our mobile vaccination efforts. Vaccine engagement teams operate through 17 geographic and population-based groups made up of over 200 health, community and faith-based organizations. These teams have mobilized more than 600 community ambassadors across Toronto to increase vaccine confidence and access. The vaccine engagement program was formed to meet extraordinary circumstances in the midst of the pandemic to ensure that real, historical and systemic barriers to vaccination are addressed. Given the success of the vaccine engagement teams, I'm recommending at next week's Board of Health meeting that the program be extended until at least the end of December 2022, and I do appreciate the support that Mayor Tory has expressed. We want to continue to ensure that Toronto residents have access to vaccines and the information they need to make informed decisions about their health and the health of their families. I know that we all want this pandemic to be over. While today, there are many reasons for hope, the pandemic does continue and COVID-19 is still circulating in our communities. We still need to be vigilant and ensure that we are doing all that we can to protect one another. Vaccination is an important part of that protection, as is continued mask wearing when indoors, outside of your home or in crowded spaces, and getting outside, bringing your social interactions outside whenever possible. Our city has come together in extraordinary ways over the last couple of years. And I, like the mayor, am hopeful for the future. If we can see each other through a global pandemic, think of all that we can achieve together as we continue to work together to build a healthier city. So with that, I think we're turning it over to questions. And Lavin, I think you're moderating the questions yeah. for us. Is this on? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so we'll take questions from the media. It's one question, one follow-up. First up, we have Clara from CBC. Are you good? So I think there's a lot of emergency, different orders and different things like that. So Torontonians might be a little bit confused. What tangibly uh, does it mean that this emergency um, order has been, has been lifted for the, the city of Toronto and how will it affect regular people? What does the meaning of the response? I think for the average person who lives in the city of Toronto, it means really that we've reached another stage in a formal sense of the management of the pandemic. Uh, it's not over, but I think it means we can remove the state of emergency so that because the main benefit of it for us in terms of the management of the pandemic was the flexibility it gave us to move people around to uh, places where they were needed most, like shelters and long term care and so on. I think from the standpoint of the average person, the rules with respect to masking, for example, which are provincial, remain in place until otherwise notified. The guidance of public health will continue to come from public health. You just heard the medical officer talk about having uh, social events outside and this kind of thing. Uh, we will continue to be careful with respect to how we organize events uh, involving the public. But uh, I think that the, you know, a large part of it today is, a, is a, a way station, a marking point that says we have reached the point as a city in terms of our ongoing management of what is an ongoing pandemic where we can take off the state of emergency and uh, just one more sign that the city is returning to a more normal state of existence. So besides, you know, this press conference today, what will you be tangibly doing to communicate to the public that the pandemic isn't over? I mean, we've seen in various jurisdictions at times things have been lifted and it's kind of been a bit of a, a free-for-all people kind of so what, what what are you tangibly going to be doing to uh ensure that people are continuing to 
to still follow best practices and things I think like the that. most important thing we will do is uh, to continue with our vaccination efforts in the community because I think when people see those ambassadors out there they see the clinics taking place whether it's in a subway station or in a mall or in uh, their own building they will know that we're continuing with this work but you know the fact of the matter is we've relied on the media throughout to communicate to people our resolve to continue with this work to continue to advise them to be careful to continue to tell them the pandemic is not over because it isn't you know just the number of people I know in my own personal orbit that got COVID in the last seven days clearly indicates it's not over but I think if people get vaccinated if they follow public health guidance if they're careful um, then we you know as we head into better weather we should be in a better position but I think the main two things we're going to keep doing you know our I've often said our prior our priorities the top three are vaccination vaccination and vaccination in that order as a city government and we will continue with those priorities as well as to try and publicize the message I suspect people are bored with me recommending they get vaccinated but I'm going to keep saying it because as long as there are people out there that haven't been vaccinated as yet we have to keep encouraging them in every way we can Thank you. Next up, we have Courtney from CB24. Good morning. This is a, a pretty optimistic update this morning. I'm wondering what it means to you as mayor to have this opportunity after an incredibly challenging two years for residents of the city to talk about the next stage and, and our high vaccination efforts and ending the emergency declaration. What does it mean to you, sir? This has been an extraordinary stressful period for everybody and when I say including for me and for Dr. Davila, we've worked hours and confronted problems and had you know questions that literally involve matters of life and death and, and the health of Torontonians and so each time along the way I was very happy the day we announced that all the public events were coming back the kinds of outdoor festivals and things that will happen that make Toronto so great in the summer. I'm very happy today uh, that we're able to be here saying the state of emergency after 777 days is to be lifted. And all of these represent nothing more but nothing less than progress along the way. Things keep getting better. The numbers keep getting better. Uh, the um, number of people getting vaccinated get better. And uh, I think that's what it means to me is just that we're on the right track. But I think we have to remind ourselves every single day, this is not over and that we have been told there's a possibility of some things perhaps that are more negative to come in the fall, but the point is to be ready for that. So we continue to plan for that eventuality. We continue to plan as to how to get more people have, have to have their fourth doses. We continue to do the work, but I think the sort of stress level and the acute nature of the pandemic has receded a bit, and it allows us to have days like today where we can remove a state of emergency, but still continuing with just as much effort on, the, on, on things like vaccination. Thank you. My next question is for Dr. Davila. It's on a, a different topic. I know the Public Health Agency of Canada has been looking into reports of this uh, acute hepatitis. I, I'm curious, are there any reports of, of cases at the local level that uh, Toronto Public Health is, is looking into? So at this point, none that I'm aware of, but of course we're aware of the situation that has given rise to concern all over the world. We know of a number of cases, over 100 cases in the United States, um, and several, many, many throughout uh, different countries uh, in Europe and in the United Kingdom as well. So uh, we know that uh, public health uh, providers, local public health has been informed throughout the province. The Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Ministry of Health have put out uh, notifications to uh, primary care and to hospital care as well so that they are aware of the obligations to report so that we can uh, quickly detect these kinds of cases here and contribute to the growing understanding and to the investigation that's happening all over the world. Um, but I think really here this points to the importance of having, you know, well-developed uh, public health systems that coordinate well with health care so that we can find these things and then figure out what's causing them so that we can then get to the business of protecting and promoting the health of our residents. So obviously we're certainly concerned about this keeping an eye out for this, uh, communicating with uh, primary care providers and other health care providers who are likely to be the first line in terms of um, seeing patients and, and young people who uh, unfortunately may be coming down with this uh, severe hepatitis uh, and this illness. Thank you. And next up, we have Moman from City News 680. Thank you. Good morning. Actually, Dr. Villa and Mayor Tory, this question is for both of you. I want to get your perspective. Uh, we heard over the weekend that Liberal leader Steve Lunduka is going to, part of his platform is to make uh, vaccine mandates uh, mandatory for children age five and up. That has uh, created a lot of uproar. There's a lot of uh, people who believe it should still be at the discretion of parents and that it shouldn't be uh, mandated by the government. And I just wanted to get your perspective whether you think that is a uh, good policy or not. 
So, uh, Moment, thanks for the question. I will say this, that you've heard me speak about this before. I put a recommendation in front of the Board of Health and it's already been adopted for the inclusion of COVID-19 vaccine uh, as part of the Immunization of School Pupils Act. So, you know, the long and the short of it is, is that we have a safe and effective vaccine, uh, incredibly studied, used all over the world now. And we know, I should say vaccines. Uh, I, I realize I said safe and effective vaccine. In fact, we have safe and effective vaccines that are available here for young people to use. Um, and we're very, very grateful. This is one of the miracles, if you will, of the COVID-19 pandemic. The fact that we went from declaration to, of a pandemic to having access to um, you know, a safe and effective vaccine that actually does provide a significant amount of protection. And we're seeing that. We're actually living the benefits of that here. And it's important for young people to get that vaccine. I'll turn it over the, to the mayor, but I do want to add one point. This miracle of vaccine, uh, as accessible as it has been here, thankfully, and as much as Torontonians have taken it up, there are still many parts of the world that have yet to get good access to this vaccine. And I do think that there's a component there that we together uh, as a community can, can um, you know, get behind because we know that this is indeed a global pandemic. It, it is something that affects all of us. And we do need to make sure that uh, those jurisdictions in the world that don't have as ready access are also afforded the benefit, the protective benefit of vaccine, because in fact, not only is it good for them, it's good for the rest of us as well. So I'll turn it over to the mayor for his comments. Well, you've heard the expert answer from Dr. Davila, and you know that I would be uh, very much inclined to follow that. But I will say one, one thing uh, in addition. I think that history has shown that vaccinations, plural, of all different kinds, have saved millions of lives, including right here in Canada, things that used to be very prevalent uh, in terms of conditions and diseases that now are basically eradicated thanks to vaccinations. And I think most people, the vast majority of people, accepted, for example, the notion that your children might not be able to go to school if they weren't vaccinated for the sake of the other children uh, involved in the classroom and things like that. I think that it, looking at the experience we've had with COVID-19, where millions of lives have been taken around the world, thousands, tens of thousands here in our own country, uh, people, I think, will understand that, uh, that there are a suite of vaccinations that people can have that can save lives and stop uh, strain on the healthcare system and stop people from getting sick, including with long COVID, and that that would be a reasonable thing to do in the context of, uh, of all the vaccinations people have, uh, have accepted having for years. I think what's happened is this has kind of escalated for some reason or other. I think probably part of this much more divisive nature of discussion in the world about issues into a political issue when in fact it's a health issue. And uh, I think that the decision should be taken, as I've said with most other things, on the basis of what is best for public health and the overall health of all people living in Toronto and Ontario and Canada. And that's the basis upon which we should make these decisions. So, so then I guess my follow up is what do you say to... Uh to parents, uh, you know, who are, are upset about this, that the decision is being taken out of their hands uh, when, you know, by and large, adults can make the decision for themselves. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not mistaken in saying this, that throughout this pandemic and going forward, people never lost the choice as to whether they got vaccinated or not. But what we did say to people, and I think it was a very reasonable thing to say, is that certain privileges, certain activities that you might engage in, um, you may not be able to engage in if you choose not to get vaccinated, but it's your choice. So I think in the end, if we maintain the principle, and I haven't heard anybody saying we're going to you know, take people against their will to a vaccination clinic and vaccinate them, people will have a choice as to what to do. The public health evidence, to me, is clear as to what they should do. And I think most people will follow that because I think most people agree with the public health advice and they agree with the results that have been achieved by vaccinations, not just COVID, but over time against all kinds of other things. But in the end, um, people will have their own choice. But I think you can rely on people most of the time, all, pretty well all the time, I think, to use common sense to make the right decision for themselves and for their families. And different people will make different choices, but I suspect I know what the vast majority will do. Okay, and then this is the last set of questions from Josh from the Toronto Star. Good morning. My question is for Dr. Davila. When did you start having these conversations with the mayor about ending this emergency declaration? And what were the, t tell me about the process. What were the specific factors that you were looking at? And were, was there like a threshold that you were looking for before you even considered uh, making this recommendation to end the declaration? 
So let me start off with the, the first thing, which is that this is clearly a decision that's taken and involves a number of people. Um, as the mayor has referred to, there was uh, Chief Pegg involved in the decision-making process as, as part of our incident commander. We have the city manager and we have an entire strategic command team that has met on a very regular basis um, earlier on in the pandemic on a daily basis uh, and continues to meet on a regular basis at this point in time in order to ensure that resources are available. So yes, there, were, um, there are a number of considerations that go into the decision. Some of them have to do with are the resources available? Are are, you know how many people are still needing to be de redeployed and how best can we uh, put the resources that we have to good effect to affect the science that needs to be done and the response that's required uh, in order to control the pandemic and to, to uh, protect the health of the people of the city as much as possible so I don't know that there were any you know you know a specific uh, uh, you know, there are thresholds, but it's not just down to one indicator. It's a series of things taken together that really looks at do we have the resources we need in place? Do we have the ability to move those resources effectively in order to provide a good response and an effective response that protects the health of Torontonians? And as a follow up, um, would you be prepared to reinstate this emergency declaration? for example, in the fall, if you find that your resources, the city's resources are stretched and we are in another wave of the pandemic, for example. So I'm gonna guess the mayor may have some comments yeah. to make on that question, but let me start off with this. Um, first of all, as you've heard, we are in a good place right now, but we are still very much in the middle of a pandemic. So of course, we're continuing to monitor the situation and we're making sure that access to vaccine you know, our, our most effective tool in our toolbox at this point in time it is readily uh, available to Torontonians. And of course, we're trying to make sure that Torontonians have uh, the tools that they need in order to best protect themselves and their families. Um, but this is always the case, uh, whether it's in public health, and I would dare say in any other aspect of the city administration, um, we're constantly, uh, you know, on guard and looking out for that which makes the most sense. How best do we protect, at least from a public health perspective, I'm certainly looking at how best do we protect the health of Torontonians? How best do we uh, promote the health of Torontonians? And so to my mind, we go where the science tells us. We go where, uh, with what is most effective in terms of delivering that protection and that health promotion to Torontonians. And if the circumstances warrant that kind of declaration, I would certainly not hesitate to make uh, a recommendation um, to the mayor and to the other city leaders in respect of what's required. But it's always premised on the situation in front of us and what the best available science and evidence tells us is required in order to affect that appropriate and effective response. I'll turn it over to the mayor now. I should say, by the way, and it'll be to the horror of my communications people that uh, as of this moment, this protocol that said one question and one follow up is no longer in place. Uh, that was not the way we operated before the pandemic. And we did it because of the pressure of these news conferences. And there were so many people on the line and it was virtual. So if you have other questions, I, I you know, I've, I've always tried to make myself accessible to you in the years before the pandemic, and I will continue to do so. Um, just on this one, um, I will not hesitate to act uh, with respect to a state of emergency or anything else based on the advice that I received from uh, when it comes to public health from Dr. Davila and from people like city manager Chris Murray, uh, from uh, you know the, the, all the apparatus that uh, really manages the city. Um, you know, my job is to do what is right in the context of keeping people safe, keeping people healthy, fighting this virus off. And so if circumstances arise in the future that okay. require that another state of emergency, well, you don't ever take these decisions lightly. I can assure you I'll get advice, I'll consider it, I'll ask questions as I do, and I will do what is right. Uh, and if that involves a state of emergency, then so be it. But, uh, you know, I think the key is to do what is right and also know when the time is to uh, take it off. And so uh, that, that is the way I'll continue to uh, oversee this and be a part of a team with uh, Dr. Davila and uh, Chris Murray and others. Any other questions for today? Yep, we do have one from Moment. Uh, you may regret opening it up back to many questions. Well, there'll, be days, <laughs> there'll be days when I'll regret going back to the old practice, but that's okay. I mean, I'm here to be accessible and answer the questions. Oh, some some I like better than others. Well, I wanted to ask you, uh, there's an item coming to council uh, 
this week again uh, from councillors Matlow and Perutza about uh, drinking, being allowed to drink in public parks uh, and beaches. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, it's something that is legal in many cities around the world, including Montreal. Uh, there are many that feel that Toronto is behind the time. So uh, are you in favor of it? And what would it take for you to be okay with uh, implementing being allowed to consume alcoholic beverages in pu public parks and beaches? I have stated repeatedly that I do not have a problem with people having a drink, a glass of wine uh, in a park. Uh, and I continue to believe that. The challenge for us becomes managing the big parties and the people who, you know, take these things and frankly abuse the privilege. And so the challenge is finding a, a route, uh, both with the law and with enforcement, uh, to, um, you know, see that reality can be reflected in the law. Because right now I think the law is not reflective of reality of what's actually going on, and I don't like that either. You know, as a lawyer and just as a person in public office, I don't like laws that, you know, people don't really respect and that they, you know, decide to operate on their own. I like the law to be consistent with, you know, the kind of behavior that we want to encourage. And in my own case, I've said many times, I don't have trouble with that. So we have to try to find a way. And sometimes the ways people put forward are unduly prescriptive. Um, but I think we have to find a way in particular to address the big parties, which have been a serious problem, resulting in a lot of complaints to my office, even as someone who supports uh, a, a slightly more flexible attitude. Uh, people have caused problems on the beaches and in some of the parks and we have to find a way to address that. So then uh, I, will you vote against it this week and what what are those steps to kind of get to a point where we can have well, we're having those discussions right now, and you know, I, I'm looking at Councillor Matlow's motion, which I think is very similar to the one he moved once before. Uh, but I will just say, my own sentiment is to have a way to find uh, the law to be more accommodating of the reality of the way people act responsibly, which is what the vast majority do. But that when it comes to what I've seen with my own eyes, people carrying you know huge stacks of stacks of two fours and kegs of beer and big boxes of wine into the park, where clearly the idea is to have a glass of wine or a beer. Uh, then we have to find ways to deal with that. And, and these aren't always simple things to deal with. So I know it, it sounds simple and it sounds easy to say everybody else deals with it effectively. We will find a way to deal with it within the context of Toronto and also a way that maintains public confidence in the fact that we can have people both enjoy that drink that I have no problem with, that drink in a park, but also make sure the parks are safe and are um, you know, hospitable for all people, including those who don't wish to take a drink. And we just have one more from Global, Bill. It's up. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning. Um, you did 20 stories today. What's next for you in the, uh, <laughs> the world of building, dissenting or climbing? You know, what I was very gratified about is that the person who asked me, who's very involved with MS, um, you know, said that he, he acknowledged that I was showing some leadership in the community and getting awareness up for MS and the people who suffer from it and in raising some money for it. And I will just say, and people know this, I've, I've gone out and done many things in the community that wouldn't have been necessarily the first thing I would have thought of for myself, but I'm doing it because I want to encourage people to support these causes, to get engaged with people who are suffering or who otherwise have adverse circumstances in their lives. And uh, if you'd asked me uh, six days ago, let alone six weeks or six months, whether I would have rappelled down the side of a 18 story building, I would have said no chance. But it was an interesting experience and I, I hope it helped raise awareness what was the real reason for MS and for people who have MS, which is very debilitating, it is something that is, you know, quite disproportionately represented here in our country. And we've got to fight it, we've got to research it, and we've got to help those people out and all the people in the future who hopefully won't get it. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks, everyone.